Listen to your favorite shows online at jupiterbroadcasting.com. This episode brought to you by GoDaddy.com. Coming up on the Linux Action Show, is this the BSD Action Show? No, but it is our Brothers in Arms episode. We get special guest host Alan on to share the love with our open source brothers. Plus, Sedega is closing down their doors and Broadcom joins the Linux Foundation. We share our thoughts on that and so much more. It's time for the Linux Action Show. Let's go! And welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 15, Episode 1. My name is Chris. My name is Alan. Hey there, Alan. Thanks for joining me today. Now, uh, people have noticed if they're watching the video version that Alan there is on Skype, and he's filling in for... he's not Brian. And he's not Brian. He's filling in for Brian today. It's kind of a funny story. What ended up happening was is we had a snowstorm last night. Around the time I was going to bed, I looked out there and I thought, uh, there's a good chance Brian's not going to make it today. We thought about doing Skype, but I think maybe he's having some uh, electronics issues with uh, the horsepower of his machine, so he wants to skip doing Skype tonight. Uh, so, Alan is going to join us, and that actually works out fantastically, because this is an episode we're going to talk all about the BSDs. Our brothers in arms out there, I'm wearing my uh, PC BSD shirt today uh, to represent, and um, of course, Alan is... He's uh, wearing my, uh, damn it, Jim, I'm a sysadmin, not a babysitter. <laughs> Very nice, sir. Very nice. And uh, you are a uh, a longtime BSD user. Alan Jude here is the is a former professor and now runs ScaleEngine.com. And ScaleEngine.com is the uh, hosting provider for Jupiter Broadcasting. It's the uh, Jupiter Colony, our team speak. They do the IRC. I mean, you guys do a ton of stuff, right? Yeah, the IRC and uh, Minecraft. Minecraft. That was the one I was thinking. Pretty much everything. Missing. And you've been using BSD for about 10 years? Yep. All right. So you've got some cred to talk about BSD. And now I realize I just dropped a little knowledge bomb on folks out there because a lot of our uh, server infrastructure used to run on Linux. And so now, of course, yes. this means that it's running on BSD. The entire Linux action show happens on BSD. Well, some of it's still on still on Linux mirrors, but yeah. We've, well, yes. And, and you know, I got to say, Alan, it's been great. Uh, and I have uh, used BSD in a previous life. I worked at a bank and we had some BSD deployments. And I've also used yep. BSD on a lot of hardware devices. And I've also, I've flirted on and off with the PC BSDs. Every time they're at Linux Fest Northwest, every year I stop in and I chat with the PC BSD guys. That's how I got this shirt, is last year I stopped in and uh, scored a shirt. Uh, so we're going to talk all about that coming up. But before we get to that, I want to show you guys my Runs Linux this week, because it's kind of awesome. It's CES 2011 Runs Linux. And that might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but you have to acknowledge the thunderstorm of Linux news annou announcements that came out at CES this year, uh, generally in the form of uh, Android. And uh, while some people might say that's not a true, uh, you know, runs Linux, I'm actually really excited about the consumer adoption of Android, even if it is Android making Android more popular, as somebody said in our IRC chat room here on the live show. Before the show started, they're like, yeah, whenever Android sells a new device, all they're doing is making Android more popular. But the reality is that thing is running a Linux kernel. It's got a lot of Linux utilities on there. It is Linux in the hands of a lot of people. And there was just a major storm of devices now coming out at CES. They're running Android. It's crazy. I mean, 2011 is just going to be nuts. Yeah. Every time anything runs Linux, it's just more, you know... Pushing yep. out the market share of it's, everything else. It's so a, that Linux exactly can take over. exactly, and then the yeah. more even the, the more people that hear about Linux, the better. Yeah, and and even if the end result is people aren't cognitively on a, on a general consumer basis aware that Android is on these devices and it's it's running on top of Linux. The end result, though, is still you're getting so much more exposure across such a wider a range of devices in, in different use scenarios than Linux has ever been in before. And that's exactly the kind of stuff that Linux needs to continue to evolve, right? Because you got to figure once yeah. you saturate a certain market, like, say, maybe the server market, and you get everybody in the server market, we've got Dell on board and HP on board and IBM on board, and they're all making their you know uh, hard drive controller chipsets and all network controller chipsets and all this stuff to be compatible with Linux and BSD. You've got to figure that Linux at a certain point will stagnate because there just won't necessarily be this need of influx of code to, to work on this stuff. So these new usage scenarios are, are still a good thing, even if they don't have Linux stamped directly on them. It's my opinion. Right. 
Exactly. Uh, like the hardware manufacturers don't have to specifically design the hardware to work with Linux. All they have to do is write decent documentation right. on how the hardware works, and the Linux people will write the drivers. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, I, I got a good Android pick this week, but before we go on, I want to holler over to our buddies at GoDaddy.com. And I was, I was, uh, was going to have Brian tell us to, show, to share a story today. Uh, one of the things that he and I did over the recent uh, week was we uh, had to move servers between uh, two different hosts, and we had two two different boxes running VirtualBox on them, and it was time to swing from one system over to the other. And so we shut down the VirtualBox services over, moved the virtual machines onto this new host, went into the GoDaddy DNS manager, and 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 it was a subdomain. So we were able to just change the subdomain, instantly hit apply, the, the updates took effect, Bob's your uncle, we're now uh, yep. moved over, we start up the virtual machines, migration complete. It was like a 15-minute server migration. And uh, really, that's kind of how all of the tools are there at GoDaddy.com, is they have a lot of great server manager tools. And if you use our code LINUX, you can save 10% when you check out. I always use your code. Hey, good man, good man. <laughs> and if you use the code LINUX20, a lot of domains. You do. Uh, you're probably single-handedly keeping us on the air. <laughs> it's a real symbiotic relationship we've set up here. It is. Um, it is. The, uh, the uh, code LINUX20 when you check out will save you 20% off uh, hosting plans if you want to get those at GoDaddy, and uh, those aren't too bad either. But now, I know a lot of folks have been waiting for my Android pick. Alan, do you do you regularly watch the Linux Action Show being a BSD guy? Yeah. Good man. Good man. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that I had an Android pick that um, I kind of was... I wasn't sure if I should really uh, make it a pick because, it, for one, it's one of the first picks I've ever done that's not free. I don't know if it's the first, but it's got to be one or two of the first picks I've ever done that's not free. And I've always right. tried to f focus on the free Android picks. Now, what kind of phone? You don't have an Android phone, do you? No, I'm, I still have an old Windows mobile phone. Oh, Alan. Apparently, apparently, this phone can run. It's an HTC, so it can run some versions of Android, but... Uh, I do need to get a new phone. Oh, Alan, Alan, yeah. You know... Uh, well, uh, the reason I bought that phone specifically was it was the one that uh, had $10 for unlimited internet because it wasn't considered a smartphone, even though it was. And uh -huh. the only app that I run on it is Pocket Putty. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, it's there's actually a surprising amount of folks in the Linux Action Show audience that have written me and said they have Windows mobile phones. I think the, I think the last audience is just a group of early adopters, and if you wanted a smartphone... And you were going to drop a bunch of cash years ago. That was one of your only options. And now you made that investment, you're kind of stuck with it. Yeah, well, the, the nice thing about the HTC Touch was I, I actually wanted the Touch Pro, which had the slide out keyboard. But with that one, it was a smartphone. So it had a $50 a month data plan. Uh huh. If you think you're getting ripped off by your mobile provider in the States, come to Canada. <laughs> yeah, um, we should say you're up in Canada. So you have a whole different ballgame up there. Yes. Uh, also, yeah. it's not here, and I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's talk about my Android pick because it's yep. it's it's one that I've been using um, since I think the beginning of December. I'm not quite sure, but I think it's been around then. And it's uh, called a Gentle Alarm. And the whole concept around Gentle Alarm is it's not one of the alarm clocks. A lot of the uh, phones now with uh, motion sensors in them, you can put them on your bed, and then if you start moving around, it figures that uh, you are in a zone to be woken up, and so it the alarm goes off if you're within a range of when your alarm's supposed to go off. But the problem is if you have anybody else, like a dog, jump up on the bed or you have a wife that moves around, you know, it sets off the alarm at the wrong time. So I've discovered I don't actually want something motion activated. Uh, so what this is, is it just kind of, it, it starts with a very gentle alarm around 30 minutes before you're supposed to wake up. And it figures its logic is if you hear that you're not in a, you're not in a, you're not in a deep sleep cycle and you can be woken up easily enough. The other thing that's nice about it is it has one button touch to disable appointments, um, uh, or, or, or I mean I'm sorry, disable the alarm for that day. Because you know like how sometimes you you got like your schedule just changed for a day or two and you don't want to have yep. to break your reoccurring alarm and stuff like that. This is really easy to do that. And um, so you combine that with the fact that it also has a nightstand mode where it can run in a dimmed mode like a desk clock. And one of the nice features it has on there is it tells you how long until it's going to wake you up. Because I, I sometimes wake up and I'm sleepy and I'm groggy and it's nice to look down and say, oh, I have two hours and 40 minutes. Yeah, I could use another two hours of sleep. You know, I don't have to do any time math or anything like that. Yeah. Plus, I get up at different times on different days sometimes, which is awful. Uh, and the other last thing that's kind of nice, if you want to go this route, and Alan, this might be a thing for you. For me, I, I would never be able to do this probably even on a good day. But it has the option where if you want to hit the snooze button 
Or if you want to just turn off the alarm and it's during the wake up cycle, like this is a time you're supposed to be getting up and you say turn off alarm. It, you do have the option to turn on like a little uh, light math puzzle game where you have to repeat from memory something that it prompts you with. And if you can complete that, it'll allow you to turn off your alarm. <laughs> right. So that you don't turn it off. And fall back asleep. Half asleep. So yeah. You're not half asleep, turning it off, and then and not even remembering you're turning it off, wake up and be like, stupid phone, why didn't you wake me up? Exactly. And I have done that. So that's kind of a neat I've feature, done that too. Once or twice too. Here's a funny yeah. thing they're doing. I'll link to mm-hmm. both versions because there's a free version and a pay version. And I recommend the pay version. And I think it's good to support these independent Android developers. But uh, yeah. their free version, the funny thing they're doing with that is it's completely functional as the pay version, except for it doesn't work on Wednesdays. So if you have Wednesday off, you're set. Mm -hmm. And in the show notes, I'll link over to uh, DownloadSquad.com. They have a really good article. Uh, They wrote up Gentle Alarm, and I think they wrote it up on the 31st of December, and it was just after about a month of usage myself, and I thought, that's perfect. I'm going to link to that in Android. Uh, I'm going to link to that Android story in last. And so there you go. That's my Android pick this week is Gentle Alarm, and you can get the free version or the pay version. And that's got to be like only the second pay app I've ever recommended. So probably worth checking out. There you have it. All right, Alan, let's do the news. And that brings us to the news. And what's new in the news this week is kind of a bombshell. Sedega is going away and becoming Game Tree Linux. Now, some of you probably have heard the name Sedega before, but don't quite remember what they're responsible for. They are a competitor to Crossover Office, and another commercial repackaging of wine, although Crossover Office is less, much less controversial. Uh, yeah. About a year or two ago, forked from the wine project when they converted to the LGBL from the BSD license because Sedega was accused of taking only the improvements, forking it, making their own product, selling that, and not giving anything back to the wine project. So the word was the wine project finally just got frustrated enough, converted to LGPL. The two never re-met again. Sedega eventually sort of lagged in features from main wine, and so now they're taking this step to go back to a community-based project. And I haven't really noticed any anything on there, what license it's going to be under. Like, I haven't seen anything that says GPL or BSD. And you still have to sign up and get a developer key in order to participate. Um, I have all the information in the show notes. But, Alan, what's your take on this? Uh, well, yeah, basically, when they got cut off from the upstream updates, they kind of withered because they didn't have enough developers to actually I you agree. Know, keep up. Yeah, I agree. And I think you and I, were before the show, were talking a little bit Um this is but probably an this issue is, uh, that's a little more common for a project that's licensed under the BSD license. And I think that kind yeah, of fits with today's theme. Yeah, well, the the people that are fans of the GPL license are always talking about how it's more free. Uh, but the, in truth, the BSD license is more free because there are no restrictions at all. And uh, so you run into this. One of the downfalls is that anybody can take the BSD license code and go and make a commercial product. Right. Of it. And that was the idea behind the BSD license, right? When a university was developing it, they were developing it for commercial applications. So, right, it was it's a basically it's a good solid reference implementation that people can base off of, right? right? Like uh, in the like the first Microsoft implementation of TCP/IP was taken from BSD, and that's why the netstat command in Windows uh, has the same command line switches as the one in BSD. Well, I mean, look at o- look at OS 10. Uh, yep. and or it, OS 10 is a great example of how the BSD license works. Uh, what Apple did is they forked FreeBSD 5 uh, for the user land. They used their own kernel, but they they used the BSD user land. And uh, they've made improvements. Uh, they added an auditing system. for uh, To be able to be used on government computers, they had to have a certain level of uh, right. auditing system. Yep. And so what they did after they wrote that was they contributed that code back to the FreeBSD project. Because, Apple did. Apple did that. Yeah. Oh. Apple did that because now the BSD project maintains that and upgrades that with each version. So when ah. they go to make the next version of OS 10 and they do the copy from FreeBSD, all their codes have been updated for them. What about and, uh, something? You see a lot of features like that with uh, companies like uh, Juniper Networks. I was going to. That's actually the company I was just going to ask about. I use a ton of their uh, net screen products that I believe are all free yep. BSD based or BSD based. Now it, there isn't. This really seems, Alan, though, to be honest with you, like a like a situation for abuse. And I'll give you an example. Is 
the, you're naming names of companies you know are contributing back to BSD, but there could be hundreds more that are just taking the code and running, right? Right. Uh, basically, the two clauses of the uh, FreeBSD license are that you can't remove the copyright, so you can't claim that you wrote it all. Okay. Uh, and that you have to reproduce the original copyright in the manual somewhere. So in the last page of the book, they put like a little two sentences or whatever. And that's all they have to do. And Okay. Uh, um, basically, we don't care. <laughs> I guess it's a risk, uh, but as long as it works well, out at a certain I, I, amount, that's all that matters. Like, uh, if you look at um, OpenSSH, yeah, uh, which is under the BSD license, is actually from the OpenBSD project, but it's licensed under the two clause BSD license. Right, so all the BSDs uh, use that, it. We'd we'd rather have companies copy that and use that as their base implementation in like the Cisco routers and they, uh, on OpenSSH's website. There's a list of hundreds of manufacturers that's open SSH. Uh, if they didn't, they would be using some other implementation uh, implementation that would have bugs that nobody would find out about. Right. Or so that, in a it way... Would, it just, it's better to have everybody using the one good implementation that everybody can keep up to date. Well, how about right. that for a rat hole for our first news story? <laughs> Let's talk about this next news story because uh, I was just uh, lamenting on the live stream that I didn't feel like any good Mego news came out of CES. I was hoping to see some Mego devices. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm just so anxious to find out what's happening with the Mego project, and I, I missed this one. And uh, thankfully, uh, Mike in the chat room uh, pointed us to a Tech Radar story. Tech Radar got their hands on a new netbook running at CES that had Mego installed on it and it looks pretty slick and they've got a they got a nice cover uh, of it it's an MSI unit that uh, looks ultra slim it's got a it's got a what they call a 100% normal size keyboard and i can't tell if the screen is touch or not but it looks like a good great ui but to be honest with you I don't really give an s um i just to me it seems like if you're going to go the netbook route and you're a manufacturer a lot of you now at this point are probably going to go chrome os I want me go on a handheld device. You know what I mean? I want to see me go on yep. a tablet or a phone. I and I was I just did not get that satisfaction from CES this year. I think that's our only CES related story that we have in the Linux Action Show. Other than the CES runs Linux that we had. I mean, that was kind of the big story really. Um yep. probably the biggest story in the Linux world this week. And it's it's usually a little slow in the Linux land after the holidays is uh Broadcom joining the Linux Foundation. And this is cool because back in September, Broadcom open sourced their drivers and really started working on yep. their hardware uh, support for Linux. And you know what? I really reap the benefits of that on my latest uh, Linux laptop that I just covered in the last episode of last. It has a Broadcom wireless chipset in it and just out of the box, uh, you know, mint booted off of the live DVD installer and I had wireless support. Now that they're joining the Linux Foundation, what that means is they're going to work on future products. Out of the out of the gate, future products should have Linux support, and that's really and from there's a lot of other implications that you know a lot more collaboration happens now that they're a member of this foundation of the Linux Foundation. But I think exactly. the, the biggest thing is starting uh, you know from Linux kernel two six three seven on, we should have out of the box Broadcom support. And Alan, how's Broadcom support been with BSD? Uh, pretty good, but that's because on BSD, uh, because we don't have the GPL license clause about uh, linking proprietary binaries yeah. uh, Broadcom can just release proprietary binary drivers and we can use them uh, but also oh so uh, they do all the driver development in house for FreeBSD not all uh, they can get uh, FreeBSD developers are willing to sign non-disclosure agreements and develop the drivers that way and then release them as binaries oh okay uh, but actually Broadcom has very good open source drivers on BSD okay well that's uh, good for the wired Ethan I don't know of but wireless, I don't deal with it much because I mostly deal with big iron servers. Right. So, but uh, Broadcom are uh, one of the names you look for in the network cards and servers because you know it'll work. Yeah. yeah you want your Intel or your Broadcom. And that's exactly. And that before. is exactly the name association Broadcom wants on exactly. uh, that type of hardware. So that's that's why they've con they're continuing to. For them, it's 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 necessary to sell exactly. their product. You know. So exactly. It's all hardware manufacturers it's like. So Linux and BSD are not asking hardware manufacturers to hire developers and write drivers for their stuff. All they're asking for is decent documentation. They'll do the work. Not keeping everything secret. And then, yeah, yeah if you give us documentation, we'll do the hard part. The for you. <laughs> exactly. all, all you got to do is not cover I know. everything up. It's crazy, right? It's ridiculous. It's like, let us write and, and manage this for you so you can sell more of your own product. <laughs> 
Uh, let's talk about there was a there was a BSD story. Let's talk about this BSD story that came out. Uh, free BSD will be running on or is now running on Amazon EC2. Uh-huh. Originally, it was only the 9.x uh, head, which isn't actually uh, out yet, but uh, 8.2 now runs. The release candidate now actually runs as of uh, January 8th. And, and you were yes. excited about the story, and to be honest with you, it seemed yes. like it was direct competition for your business model. You run hosted uh, FreeBSD well, yeah, systems. Uh, we're not, well, yeah, we want to get into doing the virtual servers as well, but uh, we're mostly more of grid than cloud hosting at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but actually what it is is the FreeBSD security officer, uh, Colin Percival, he developed a uh, remote backup system called Tarsnap that's like super encrypted. Yeah. Uh, and he runs it all off uh, Amazon, especially the S3 for the storage. Oh, and sure. he was mad that he couldn't, run FreeBSD on his EC2s. Yeah. Uh, so he uh, talked to some people at Amazon and then uh, signed a non-disclosure agreement and worked with them uh, to actually make it so you can run uh, FreeBSD. What, do you know EC2. what that is? Is it like, uh, is it um, building well, EC2 hardware support into the kernel? Uh, well, basically EC2 is a modified version of Zen yeah. as far as I'm aware. And uh, but the way they have it, uh, like with an EC2, when you fire it up, uh, there's a procedure that happens that feeds your private key into the virtual machine so that you're able to log into it as root uh, with your SSH private key. Yeah. And um, uh, basically, that wouldn't work under BSD. And so the way it had to work was the partition where the kernel actually resides had to be EXT2 formatted uh, for the Amazon control system. (laughs) So uh, there's a... An EXT2 partition with the FreeBSD kernel and the boot files, and then it boots your regular uh, UFS formatted file system, and you get your whole file system. Okay. BSD runs. You know this. Uh, this more really details is... than that is actually what was protected under the non-disclosure agreement, and oh, yeah? I'll talk about. Uh, but basically, Amazon was willing to work with somebody to get FreeBSD on EC2. They just didn't want to. Um, give away all the secret sauce. Of, oh, so there is some secret sauce you got to know to make a, to make something work on EC2. I guess there uh, would have to be, right? Make it's, some other OS work on EC2. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, exactly. You'd have to but be because they're proprietary it's, systems. It's the secret sauce of what makes EC2 better than just what anybody can set up with Zen server. Interesting. And Amazon obviously didn't want to give that away. Uh-huh. Because if they had, then I would have my competitor for EC2 up today instead of in a couple of months. <laughs> well, and, and they must have made the same arrangement with Canonical, right? Because you can get Ubuntu on EC2. Well, that's just this is the same as any other Linux. So they they did the work. Oh, they did. Idea. Okay, okay. Now they, they build EC2 to run Linux. Do so you just do, the, some of the changes to run BSD? But do you foresee? Maybe EC2 being as an augmentation to your infrastructure. That's how I currently um, see the practical uses had of it. A plan to use it as backup emergency. Exactly. If we yeah. Ran out of capacity, uh, but at the moment it it was too expensive. Uh, it is. Yeah. Um, it, the, with the new uh, tiny tiny implementation, which is basically uh, free, it's not so bad. Yeah. 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 Uh, actually, uh, if you look, Amazon is giving one tiny instance for free for a year. I know. How cool uh, is that? It's very cool, except for a tiny is pretty much useless, but that's why they're giving it away for free. Yeah, but if you're just farting around. And then start paying, Exactly. Uh, But also, you have to be careful if you uh, use any bandwidth or anything, they start charging you. Uh, Yeah, yeah. I tried to put one. I I had a server running for 24-7, and it... Two tiny implementations or whatever. Yeah. And he, like, went over his hours by, like, a minute or something, and it started charging, like, 16 cents or something. I accidentally left an EC2 server running idle for 30 days, and it cost me about $250. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas you rent a dedicated server with yeah. big hardware from somewhere for no. In my yeah. est- in my estimation, an in depth look on EC2 like uh, almost two years ago. Actually, yeah, I did it in December of like 2008 or something, and maybe it was 2009. And uh, I at that end of it was basically, and it's still the same conclusion I have is in a pinch. I like the option of being able to spin up additional infrastructure support. Yeah, especially if you all of a sudden need like ten of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like a launch day or yeah, exactly. So yeah, the like, fact that uh, BSD's in there now too is awesome. Yeah, actually, uh, there was I, I wrote an article uh, months and months ago now, but uh, about how you could use a bunch of Amazon EC2s to crack DES encrypted passwords. Where do you find that? At? That sounds fun. Where can yeah, we find I'll that? <laughs> yeah, put it in the show notes. I think people yeah. would like to see that. Hey, you know what? I, I, we got to get into BSD. So, I, you know, that's all the news for this week. Now, 
awesome segment. Music brings us right to the BSD segment. I know you guys, it's brothers in arms, and you thought, what are they talking about? Do they mean Haiku OS? Probably. Uh, if Brian was here, it might have been Haiku OS. But no, with Alan here, we're going to focus on BSD just like we have all this week. Primarily, though, uh, what do you think, Alan? Free BSD, we're safe to focus on? Yeah, it's it's the main one. Yeah, there's the, there's there's other ones like NetBSD, which focuses on portability, and you got OpenBSD, which is well known for security. Security, and they have a lot of projects like OpenBGP, OpenSSH, yep. and so on. But uh, yeah, it's mostly security research there. Now, uh, I wanted to I wanted to maybe thought I th- for people that are probably sort of inherently familiar with Linux, there is a one major philosophical different approach to to the development of these two different operating systems that I think is a good place to start just to sort of break down the differences between Linux and FreeBSD. And yep. and I my kind of noobish explanation of that is that Linux is built uh, – Linux starts at a kernel level, and then on top yep. of that kernel, you have different projects, mainly the GNU, which of other projects – with each their own design approach, their own philosophy, their own cultures that contribute a collection and series of different utilities into Linux. And uh, so maybe like, you know, VI and, and, and those types of things, they have their own consistency. But from uh, from point one to point B, from point A to point B, there's there's a wide range of different design philosophies that have happened. Whereas with free BSD, my understanding is is one team top to bottom manages the whole project, everything from the kernel to LS. Yep. Now, exactly. It's uh, it comes as an entire operating system, uh, the user land utilities and the kernel and all the glue that puts everything together uh, that you'd normally get from. Uh, you have with Linux, you'd have the kernel and then the user land, and yeah. then the glue comes from the distribution, like Ubuntu or CentOS sure. or whatever. Sure. With uh, FreeBSD, it's all one group of people. Uh, how do how do things like uh, PCBSD fit into that world? I think a lot of people. Well, what PCBSD does is takes FreeBSD and then adds their own stuff on top of it. They basically have a set of scripts that sit on top of any version of FreeBSD since I think six, and uh, basically they have uh, they replace the standard installer with a graphical one that automatically configures comp is and the NVIDIA drivers and a couple oh, of things. Oh, that's handy. Uh, and. FreeBSD uh, is more slanted towards servers, so the installer uh, yeah. doesn't by default install X and KDE or GNOME. It doesn't even, uh, yeah. It's just, a, it, yeah, it, when you install FreeBSD, it's just text. It's easy to add them, right. but uh, right. Uh, they're not on by default. With PCBSD, they are. because it's. Uh, but what PCBSD really is was a solution for companies that wanted to run something other than Windows on their like workstations. Hmm. So and, this has been moved forward by a company called IX Systems, who came along yeah, and acquired PCBSD. PC, yeah, or I think they started it or funded it or something. Or, or I yeah, think they, the, the main developer Chris the company, worked for them or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there, there's a company that provides the phone support, the subscription phone support for PCBSD, which is what one of the requirements that a company would have to run uh, something other than Windows on their. Right, so and they so they sell a range of desktops, hardware, server, all that kind yeah, of stuff, and support yeah, they packages. Sell, basically, they've been a, a BSD hardware manufacturer. Like they make systems that are guaranteed to work with BSD, uh, and then they was like, "Well, we want to make an enhanced version of the OS for desktops, so we right. can move on from selling just servers to selling large numbers of desktops." Now, P- PCBSD's probably claim to fame is their uh, PBI Dur that we've talked a little bit before on last. Do you have any thoughts on the PBI Dur, Alan? Uh, it. It makes some things a lot easier. Uh, it's a much easier transition for people that are used to Windows. Basically, you go to their website, uh, PCBI or uh, PBI Dir, and it's kind of like download.com from CNET or uh, any the way you would get Windows software, right? You go to the website, you find the one you want, you click on it, and you download this yeah. little .pbi file, right. which is like the .msi files you get in Windows. Then you double click it, and you get a little dialog, and then next, 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 finish kind of thing yeah uh, it's, it's very it's simple very easy, easy transition for people that are used to windows yeah and it's got and then with everything kept in that one spot will you update just that program it updates just its own dependency that's kind of nice right. uh, i get the yeah, logic there it has private dependencies so uh each program has a bunch of dependencies but each gets their own separate copy installed in like a subdirectory so that uh, you don't end up with version conflicts. It was like, oh, this one needs this version of OpenSSL, but this one needs this version of OpenSSL, especially because they're binaries, right? You're not compiling from uh, – normally BSD doesn't have this problem because you're compiling everything from source with the ports. Right. Uh, but they do have the binary distributions if you want them. But with the PBIs, they're binaries, so 
uh, they had to find some solution around the problem that different versions of programs are going to link against different versions of OpenSSL or some other dependency like uh, Lib International and so on. But can I ask you a question? Uh, because mm -hmm. I've heard the biggest the biggest critique that I've heard with this arrangement is that if say Pigeon has an update to fix Lib Purple because of a uh, a uh, bug in the code and uh maybe something else uses lib purple say another another messaging program or something like that and pigeon gets updated but the lib purple library on the other application might not get updated at the same time you got to right. wait for each but independent application if to update. the other applications binary hasn't been recompiled on the pbi source then you wouldn't be able to upgrade right if you're looking if you had something like uh, yum if the set if the other app that uses lib purple doesn't have a new binary release yet you wouldn't be able to upgrade anyway True, true. So, so basically, you're kind of you just have to upgrade both apps, but with the PBI system, it doesn't have to be at the same time. Touche, sir. With now, more app has to be now. So, but that it could be a problem, right? It, 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 there is the downside that that means that that program that uses the older version of LibPurple exactly. or OpenSSL is vulnerable. Exactly. Uh, but there's a their auto updater will keep everything up to date as soon as there is a newer version. And, okay, I guess that's uh, I as good it, as you get. It might give you. I, I haven't used it. But it it should give you uh, um, some kind of warning saying you should. It not does, use that you know. I've used PSD it, because there's a, not a newer version. I've used PCBSD on and off, and it does come up with like a little prompt, just like a Windows update or like a, you know Ubuntu update or the Fedora Yum Manager. It comes up with a little prompt that says, "Hey, you got some updates you got to do," and it. I mean, it seems to be fine. Uh, and for FreeBSD with the port system, there's a program called Port Audit that yeah. basically audits all the applications you have installed against the vulnerability XML database and says these ones need to be updated. The FreeBSD project, uh, switching back from PCB, PCBSD to over to FreeBSD, the PC, uh, the, or I'm sorry, the FreeBSD project has an amazing handbook uh, that has been going yes. on since the mid-90s and is just an ex outstanding resource. It really is because everything's consistently like made. You can go find it there. chapters, too. <laughs> yeah. Now, um... And it's updated constantly and translated into like 70 languages. I have uh, done some personal tests uh, comparing. This has been probably about three years since I've done this. So this isn't with, you know, extended four and things like that. But in my performance benchmarks, I was specifically targeting disk IO. And I found right. that uh, I could I could put a lot more data a lot faster on a, a large set of disks using BSD than I could with any Linux file system at the time. And I must have tried yep. Riser, XFS, and Extended 3. Part of that is uh, the file system. Uh, UFS 2 uses uh, soft updates. Uh, so basically, yeah. it's a way to uh, separate the metadata updates from the data. Uh, and But it's in a way that if there's a sudden power failure, you don't lose any data. Whereas with uh, EXT 2 and 3, a sudden power failure was always a big deal. And sure. it also meant that you had that long uh, FSCK scan at the next boot up after it. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> with, FreeBSD, the, with FreeBSD, what it does is it uses the snapshot system in the file system uh -huh. to do the FSCK in the background after the machine's back up. So it gets your machine back online, gets your websites back up, and then does the file system check on a snapshot of the disk. That's so clever. That it can... Fix the problems, but you can still have. And then uh, can it apply the, the fix to the right. snapshot back to the live file system? I don't know. Okay. I've never actually had it find a problem. <laughs> but, really? Uh, in 10 years? <laughs> uh, well, uh, no, this is. This oh, is, I guess. Uh, background right. is this, only since yeah, BSD that's 6. That's true. Right, that's uh, true. But yeah, most of the time, it's like I only usually lose power to my servers when I purposely remote reboot them because they're. Not working, so yeah, they're yeah. usually not using the disk at the time anyway. I guess, uh, I guess, you know, my end experience was though in my benchmarking was that the Linux performance was was sufficient enough, and the vendor application support was either Windows or Linux. I ended up going Linux because when I stacked the when I stacked Linux and I stacked FreeBSD head to head. Um, they still both performed better and more reliably than Windows Server did. So I ended up just yes. going with Linux, and that's always how I've always gone. And now that I'm a heavy desktop user, I feel like Linux is maybe a little more appropriate place for me to sit. And I know, you know, in our show notes, I mentioned Comp is and Flash and things like that. that well, and I, um, I know they I, run I under FreeBSD. The in there. I know they run <laughs> under yeah. FreeBSD, but under emulation, right? Oh, uh, no. Well, Comp is. 
Okay. Is sort so it, it's always worked out, right? Because uh, KDE and GNOME and whatever sure. are identical on BSD as they are on Linux. Uh, the uh, Flash and Flash 64-bit run under the Linux Ulator, which isn't really emulation. Basically, it's a kernel module that adds the system calls that BSD doesn't have that are specific. So it's kind of like what Wine is and, for Windows applications. Uh, kind of, yeah. It's not an emulator. An API it's translator. An yeah, it, it translates the Linux APIs into the BSD ones. It, the only, it, it's only missing one major system call, which is that uh, ePoll, because uh, FreeBSD has their own better version called KQ. Oh, now what does that affect? So, uh, but, uh, I know that the early betas of TeamSpeak 3 server ran under BSD. The later betas didn't, and the newest betas do. <laughs> so it just depends on the it, application. Yeah, basically when you're dealing with only the binary, if they didn't compile it to pick, whether to use select or pull or epoll or gotcha. kq, if, if they hard coded use one, yeah. then uh, it might not work. But almost everything I've ever used runs under the Linux later, and because it's not emulation, you, there's no speed loss. You've I, done I was, you've done your own amount of benchmarks server, being a yeah. server guy like I did, and you took a look at MySQL uh, and well, I didn't do those benchmarks. Those oh, okay. Videos more professional. Oh, you're right. Yeah, these come yeah, these are these are actually hosted on the people.freebsd.org site. Yeah, uh, one of the uh, guys that goes to a lot of the conferences uh, and yeah, he compared a bunch of different versions. And to be honest with you, Alan, it's you cannot deny, it. I mean, FreeBSD has a serious performance edge. And it well, and, uh, and it holds this, this a lot is better. This uh, something that happened a little while ago. Uh, at the end of FreeBSD 4, uh, there was a bit of an argument about what should be the next major focus when they went to five? And that's actually where the Dragonfly BSD comes okay, from. Okay, let's talk about Dragonfly. I had, I've had some so, questions in the chat room about Dragonfly. Yeah, so basically uh, Dragonfly forked off because they wanted to keep working uh, with the FreeBSD 4.11 and continue that and move it towards uh, some other features. With FreeBSD 5 and beyond, they started what's called the uh, SMPNG, so Symmetric Multiprocessing Next Generation. Because they uh, knew multiple cores was going to be a big deal. Yeah, uh, and back then, nobody was really acknowledging the fact that multiple processors with multiple cores and now multiple threads with hyperthreading uh, was going to become a big thing. I think FreeBSD uh, so was spent, well, ahead of Linux on that uh, by a couple of years, weren't they? Uh, quite a few, yeah. Yeah. And so they spent like five years uh, basically developing, redeveloping the entire kernel and getting rid of all the exclusive giant locks and everything so that it could run across a lot of processors. And uh, so when you look at those graphs, you can see that uh, it holds steady as you scale up to hundreds of threads even, uh, whereas uh, the older versions of BSD and Linux all trail off as you get more and more threads. You get this contention. Yeah, yeah. Image. These uh, benchmarks you linked us to kind of show that. And, and honestly, and honestly, that was the exact scenario in my testing. As I increased the load uh, in my disk throughput, Linux mm -hmm. would substantially increase the CPU load. Right. While FreeBSD was either doing a better job of handling that processing off to the SCSI controller card or yep. whatever it was doing, it did it at a less performance overhead. Right. And uh, that could also be um, FreeBSD might have had slightly better drivers. I, you know what? Totally could have been drivers. It because, totally could have been. Uh, they work with the, uh, will work with the providers under non disclosure agreements and stuff, whereas some of the Linux developers like to try to avoid that. Sure. Sure, I guess. And basically, even just because more companies that use a lot of bigger iron servers will work with BSD. And so companies like Adapt Tech that make the RAID controllers kind of focus on BSD as, as one of the primary operating systems for their drivers. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to say what it was. But I, at the end yeah. of the day, like I said, I ended up sticking with Linux because to me, overall, the vendor support and the third-party application support still seems... It, it, it just seems like if people are making something that's that's for a Unix of some type, it, they're making it for Linux, generally. Right. And uh, usually, it's it doesn't take that much effort to get that to run on BSD as well. Yeah. But there is sometimes that small amount of reconfiguring, or just even if it's just the fact that the past, everything is slightly different. Uh, FreeBSD has a very strict uh, structure to the file system. Basically, uh, like... In Linux, when you install something, it usually go under like user bin or like user lib. Yeah. Uh, FreeBSD, everything under slash USR is what came with the operating system, and you don't 
change that. All the okay. uh, applications and packages you install okay. go under user local and then bin or lib or even even the files that go in etc. I've noticed right? that. If install, if user install local like package, Etsy. Yeah, it, it goes under user local Etsy and then usually the program name too. Yeah. So it's more organized. But basically it means that, uh, for example, you actually can have two copies of OpenSSL installed. The version that came with the OS, mm -hmm. right? You know mm -hmm. how like uh, with CentOS... They have one version of OpenSSL that they come with. Yeah. And they basically only apply security updates and never the... Yeah, the package updates. manager maintains that version that they shipped with. Yeah. Right. Sure. Well, FreeBSD has the same thing, except for they keep it completely separate. So you can install the uh, a newer package of it and use that instead and just tell your program to link against that instead. Oh. And uh, it was actually... A, it was uh, even bigger when FreeBSD 4 came with Perl 5.0 installed. It was actually part of the base operating system because all the little admin scripts that relied on it. They've since rewritten all those in C or Shell, but um, everybody wanted Perl 5.8. So you install that, and it would basically override the base install one, except for programs that specifically mention 5.0. Nice. I got gotcha. you. I'm following you. That uh, makes so much more sense an now. An example that gets why it keeps everything separate. It also means that you can upgrade the operating system binaries yeah. uh, without having to necessarily recompile your applications. If you're using the FreeBSD update tool, you can switch minor versions like 8.0 to 8.1 without recompiling any of your binaries. Gotcha. But if you're going from uh, 7.x to 8.x or 8 to 9, then you have to recompile all your packages. Alan, let me stop you there to make sure our recording isn't messed up because we're running on uh, janked yeah, up hardware. Yeah. So I'm We're back. Sorry about that, everyone. We had a uh, hard drive fail in our uh, RAID system over there in our recorder, and the uh, good folks in the IRC chat room let me know that, uh, uh-oh, they say we're as bad still. So we're going to, what do you think, Alan? I still got you there, right? Yep. I'm All still. right. So we're going to, we'll try to wrap this show up before, while we still have some hard drive space. We're running on a <laughs> reduced yep. capacity rate. It's, I don't know, yeah. man, between the snow and Brian's Skype issues and now a hard drive died. It just wasn't meant to yeah. be. But Alan, I want to thank you for joining me. It's been really, no really problem. awesome to get a BSD perspective on this kind of stuff. And I'd like yep. to know what you guys out there think. Let us know in the comments. Go over to jupitercolony.com. We have a forum in there just for the Linux Action Show where you can share your thoughts. And of course, uh, the Linux Action Show comes out every Sunday and hopefully we'll be back to a regular show uh season 15 folks how about that starting season 15 with a bsd episode huh yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> we're crazy we're crazy um yes I, keep I, doing that i was, <laughs> <laughs> I was I gonna know. say i think we next episode i think next, news. next episode we're gonna be back to more linux topics alan i'm sorry yeah. i'm sorry yeah, that's okay it's, there's not that much news really with bsd you know it just works you, there's no news there you could do a bsd monthly show i suppose <laughs> Maybe. Do. Right, maybe maybe BSD quarterly. Let's see. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Linux Action Show, and we'll see you right back here Sunday. Yeah.